pencils. So let's do it. That's me, my face. It looks like I might be in a kitchen. I'm smiling in a goofy way. And there is a ladle with little cherry tomatoes. We'll talk about what a ladle is in a minute. But you may have heard of appliances. We are not talking about appliances today. We're talking about utensils. But in order to talk about utensils, we should probably say what they are not. They are not appliances. If you look at that picture, it looks like on the left, that might be an oven. And in the middle, it's probably a refrigerator and a freezer. And all the way to the right, looks like that's probably a dishwasher. And those are all appliances. If you look down, a utensil is a tool that you use in the kitchen to help you cook or eat. Okay, so not really an appliance. Things like spoons, forks, knives are utensils. They make it easier for you to prepare and enjoy your food. Now, there's one thing that appliances have, and I think it's electricity. You usually plug in appliances. They are usually bigger than utensils. So appliances. Kitchen appliance is a machine in the kitchen that uses electricity to help with cooking and preparing food, like a microwave or a blender. And I believe Bob the Canadian talked about both yesterday. I know he talked about a blender. So a utensil probably doesn't use electricity, probably a little smaller. An appliance, probably bigger than a utensil and you might have to plug it in. It probably uses electricity. So let's talk about this first one here, a cutting board. This is probably very easy to explain because you can see the picture and you probably have that in your kitchen right now. Like, oh, okay, I know that, okay? So they call it a cutting board in English, perfect. But I do have an example sentence for you. And I do have a definition, which will hopefully help improve your English here. So in English, we say a cutting board is a flat surface for cutting or chopping up food. So you can cut with a knife. I have a, a sentence for you in a minute, or you can chop with a knife. That's another verb that you might hear. And chop up is the phrasal verb. English speakers love to put up at the end of verbs. Chop up. It really doesn't change the definition at all. I need to chop up this green pepper for my salad. How about this? I use a knife to chop vegetables on the cutting board. So there's a little help with a preposition, you would say on the cutting board. How about this next one? This next one actually has two words that we might use to describe this utensil. You might hear strainer. And if you look at the picture, it looks like water is going through this utensil and it's coming out a little bit smaller. I'm going to talk about the verb drain in a minute, but you might hear this utensil called a strainer or a colander, not a calendar. Calendar like today is December 2nd, not a calendar, a colander, a colander, strainer, colander. I will use both terms for this utensil. So what is a strainer? Again, you probably have this in your kitchen right now. If you ever make pasta, you probably need a strainer 
or your pasta is going to be very watery. So a strainer is a bowl with holes in it for draining liquids. Many people use this when making pasta. Yeah, strainer. You boil your pasta in water, but you don't want that water with your sauce. So you will put your pasta in a strainer in order to remove the water. Another name for a strainer is a colander. We use both. I think I mostly use strainer though. Colander sounds a, a little bit more proper. And when I'm in the kitchen, there's nothing proper about that. So I use strainer. But let's use colander in a sentence. She used a colander to drain the pasta. Drain can be a verb. Right now in that picture, whatever is in that colander is being drained. So it could be pasta. It could be, it could be vegetables in there too. Maybe to wash the vegetables. But I do want you to be careful because we sometimes have the noun drain. And you might see this at the bottom of a shower, at the bottom of a tub, or at the bottom of a sink. Let's talk about that verb though. I use the verb drain. She drained the pasta. Here's the definition of the verb. When you drain something, it means you remove the water or the liquid from something. For example, when you finish washing your vegetables, you drain water by letting it flow away, leaving the veggies dry. Did you know that? Sometimes we call vegetables veggies. Just because vegetable is such a long word in English, and so many of us native English speakers are lazy. We try to get rid of some syllables. Vegetables, vegetables, veggies, just shorter. When you drain something, it means you remove water or liquid from something. For example, when you finish washing your vegetables, you drain the water by letting it flow away, leaving the veggies dry. Hopefully that helps. But the verb drain is different from the noun drain. There is a picture of a drain that looks like it might be in a sink. So you might also find a drain in a sink or a shower to let the water drain out. Hopefully that's not too confusing. Same word, one we use as a verb, one we use as a noun. Let's check the chat here. Are there any questions? Are there any comments? So there are 37 people watching. So I don't think there will be too many comments. I think I can answer all of those comments. But whoa. Sita, thank you so much. Sita has been a channel member for a long time and she does this from time to time. Thank you so much for the super chat. I have a little something for you and it also gives me a chance to take a drink. Oh, thank you so much for the super chat. Thank you, Sita. And you may be watching at home and saying, you know what? I don't have enough money for a super chat. And I'm sure that is a lot of people. I don't want you to feel pressure to leave a super chat. They are nice, but you don't have to. But you know what you could do? That's free. Subscribe. Hit that thumbs up button. That would be super helpful. But Sita, thank you so much. Thank you so much. What else do we have here? I'm going to leave that up. For a little while because that is super nice thank you Sita. that means a lot all right i am trying to go back through the chat to see what i've missed manual hope you're doing well it has been a minute he said it's been a minute dude which is a good way to say hey 
haven't seen you for a little while, but I do remember Emmanuel. I believe he lives in Brazil, right? Michael. Michael was in the chat earlier. Present Gaming. Hope you're doing well. Abbas. What is that? What is that? Is that? My eyes are so bad, but I know that the that's a U.S. flag there. Is it Belgium? Is it the Belgian flag? Could be. Leo, how are you? Welcome, welcome. Omron. Looks like I'm standing in front of a pizza in the thumbnail. No, that was a uh, a ladle. We'll talk about ladle in a little bit. It's like a big spoon for for soup or maybe stew. We'll talk about the difference between a soup and a stew. But it was a, a ladle full of tomatoes, I think. Yeah, aforementioned. It is a big word. It's a very fancy word. If you're presenting to an audience you might say oh the aforementioned and it just means you've mentioned that subject before yeah so what is was it harry since i think i talked about harry before he commented and then he commented so i said oh the aforementioned harry just trying to be a little bit proper bring a little class to american english with brent and yeah, I did. I did change the uh, change the name of the channel once again. Mega is here. Mega, long time member. You know what? I I thought so. I took notes, Harry. I took some notes on what I wanted to talk about, and uh, mortar and pestle did not make the final cut but maybe I could talk about it right now. Yeah, Abdi, cutting board and chopping board. We use both terms here in the United States. All right, go, going back to a mortal, mortar and pestle. The question is, was that common in the United States? I don't own one. I'll say that. But it is for um, a new verb here. It's basically like a cup and a, a tool where you can grind up, maybe that's a English phrasal verb, where you can grind up or mash herbs. Uh, yeah, it's not very common. Maybe it's common in, I can put up a picture and then you'll be, oh, okay, I know exactly what that is. So let me put up a picture. Cause like I said, I almost, I was going to talk about it, but I thought, you know, if I don't own one, maybe I shouldn't. But since Harry talked about it, there you go. That's a, a mortar and pestle right there. Yulia, what's going on? All right, we'll get rid of that. We will uh, talk about these guys in a minute. Just going through the comments, making sure there aren't any questions. Ina, good to see you here. Oh, geez, rad. I did not talk about a sifter. Let's pull one up. That's good. Um, you use this when you are baking, and it is to get rid of lumps. Lumps in your flour. Sifter. Okay, I will bring up a picture of this. Now, in my classroom, I do have students that I teach every day in a classroom. I do teach English. And I do need to give a shout out to one of my students. His name is Jonas. And it was his idea a couple weeks ago. He said, you should do kitchen utensils. And I said, yeah, I should. So we've talked about lumps in my classroom. Let's see if I can bring this up. Lumps, I've found, is kind of hard to explain, to be honest. But let's say you make your bed and the sheet on your bed is supposed to be nice and smooth, nice and flat. But if there is something under it, 
Maybe you forgot your phone under your sheet. There will be a lump. And sometimes when you're baking a cake and you use flour, there could be lumps in the flour. So you might use a sifter to get rid of those lumps. You can use it for more than just flour, but that is one way to use a sifter with flour. All right, let's see. Anybody else? Brent, I was wondering how many subscribers do I have from Rio? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I probably could find out, but I do know that depending on the month, the number one country that my subscribers come from is the US. That does not change. It's it's usually the US. But some months the number two country is Brazil. Some months it's Russia. So they go back and forth. But the top three countries is the United States or are the United States, Brazil, and Russia. Two and three change sometimes. But so it could be quite a few. I'm not sure. Emmanuel, I don't know if Emmanuel lives in uh, Rio or not, but I know he lives in Brazil. Oh, wow. So, Mina, love your country, uh, my country, the U.S., more than your country. Oh, it was Belgium. Good. Thank you. Uh, Mina, what is your country? I'm curious. Please leave that in the chat. What is your country? Oh, good. Right winter. So, when you borrow a book of cooking, you see only the pictures because the vocabulary is new. So, hopefully, between my lesson and Bob the Canadian's lesson, it will help you a little bit. Yeah, but I do have an English lesson on cooking. A couple years ago, I made borscht. So maybe you want to look that up. Jamie Watson is in the house. All right. No, Mina, just by watching, liking the videos, that really helps. So no pressure to leave super chats. No pressure at all. Thank you for watching. All right. Love that. Hansna, you teach amazing. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you for subscribing. Yeah, I hope I'm saying that right. Pestle. Pestle and... That, yeah, that's probably why I didn't put it on the... Um, the lesson either because I may be pestle and mortar though. Pestle, pestle. There's a little bit of a T there. Pestle. Yeah. But I don't use it. Too fancy for me. Venezuela. Carlos, welcome. Yeah, maybe since Sao Paulo is so big. Yeah, so many people live there. All right, Clive, can I make a, a video about the MLB? Maybe. I will be making one about American football soon. Pretty soon. Next couple weeks. All right. And Sita, once again, thank you so much for that super chat. All right. I think I've asked people to subscribe, like, comment, all that stuff. Let's get back to the lesson. We were talking about drain. We just talked about that, didn't we? So now... Let me pull up the next one. After drain. Okay. This is this is a little little confusing right here. The next one is greater. And notice the way that is spelled. If you look at that picture, in the picture, the silver utensil is a greater. And on the left of that greater, you will have some whole carrots and on the right of that grater you will have what we might call some grated carrots not chopped those were not cut with a knife they were grated with a grater that's why this can be this can be pretty confusing because we have two ways to spell grater that way and a grater 
is a tool for shredding food into small places. A grater is a tool for shredding food into small pieces. So you, you might also hear this called a shredder as well, but most people will call it a grater. Shredding just means you, and we sometimes use this with paper, but you take an object that is, is big and you make it smaller. So those carrots are grated carrots, maybe shredded carrots. You'll definitely hear this with cheese as well. So I grated the cheese to put on top of the pizza. I grated the cheese to put on top of the pizza. And that last sentence, grated, was a verb. It can also be used as an adjective to describe nouns, to describe things. I put grated cheese on top of the pizza. You might use a grater for vegetables or cheese. But we also have this word, grater. They sound exactly the same. You can use a grater in the kitchen or you can have this, grater. So grater, when it's spelled this way, it means larger in size or number, or maybe more important. So Bob the Canadian has a greater number of subscribers than I do. I have about 25,000. He has well over a million, I think over a million and a half, greater in number. And if you look at that picture right there, there are two fish bowls. We would call those two things fish bowls. And it looks like a goldfish is jumping from one bowl to the other. Looks like a small bowl to a bigger bowl. So here's a sentence using greater and that picture. Let me make it a little bigger. There is a greater amount of water in the fish bowl on the right. So it looks like that little goldfish sees the little bowl and thinks, maybe I don't want to live here anymore. I need to make the jump to the bigger bowl. So there is a smaller bowl and there is a larger bowl. But when you talk about the amount of water in each bowl, you could use greater or lesser. So let me change that sentence at the bottom. There is a lesser amount of water in the fish bowl on the left. I know it can be a little confusing. Hopefully that helps though. Maybe if it is confusing, watch this English lesson a couple times. Maybe watch it once or twice or listen to the podcast. Or in a couple weeks, I think I will make this English lesson a little smaller, a little shorter. What about this? A whisk. Oh, wait. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot. I have a picture of grated cheese. Let's get rid of that. Yeah. We used this sentence earlier. I grated cheese to put on top of the pizza. And remember, in that sentence, grated is a verb. It's something you did. You used a grater to grate that cheese. But you can also use grated as an adjective which describes the cheese. I put grated cheese on top of the pizza. Hopefully that makes sense. Whisk. Again, with our utensils, you can have a noun. So you can use a whisk but it can also be used as a verb, something you, you do. So I used the whisk to whisk eggs. Now, luckily, if you look at the picture and you spend some time in the kitchen, you're like, oh, okay, I know what that is in my native language. You just have to look at a picture. But sometimes it can get confusing because 
I don't know. In your language, does the utensil and the thing you do have different names? In English, most of the time, they don't. Our utensils and the things we do with them are like the same word, but it can be a little confusing. A whisk is a utensil for mixing or whisking ingredients. It's very common to whisk eggs before cooking them. So at least in the United States, some people like to have scrambled eggs or omelets. And to make an omelet, you will often whisk the eggs before you cook them. And when you whisk eggs, you put air into them to make them more fluffy. Might be a new word there or two for you. Here's a sentence we might use with whisk. And this is whisk as a noun. He used a whisk to beat eggs. All right. Take a second here. Check the chat. Make sure I'm not missing too many things here. Uh, Sita, again, thank you so much. She said, ah, don't mention it. Don't mention it. Look at that. Mina is here. Amina has been a member for 41 months. Amina, thank you for all of your support. Been very generous to the channel over the years. Yeah, I've had this channel. Next month, it will be four years. And I almost think Amina was there from like almost day one. That 40 mo 41 months is from when this channel got monetized, from when I could have members. And I believe Amina has been a member since the first month. It might have been April of 2020. So thank you so much. Leo, how long is this live stream going to be? I don't know. It's going to be as long as it needs to be. So I try to go 40 minutes to an hour. So just trying to explain all the terms I have and answer the questions. Whoa, Harry. I think you just blew my mind. Okay, I'm going to read this slowly and try to figure this out. Your greater is greater than my greater. Yeah, so in this way, I could, maybe I just have a superior greater. Maybe my greater is just better than Harry's greater. But everything is written there correctly. So your greater is greater than my greater. Oh, you forgot a period, Harry. The English teacher in me should say, don't forget your period. But other than that, you use the correct your and you use the greater, spell that correctly when you use it as an adjective and the nouns. We won't get too much into, uh, into uh, English, English, English grammar. Harry, thank you. 21 months. That's almost two years. It's a lot of commitment. Thank you, Harry. All right. Hmm. Somebody calling me by my last name, Flame. Hmm. I wonder if that's one of my students at, at school. If you are, welcome. All right. Okay. Brent, I'm willing to come to your country. That's three. Sri Lanka. Oh, very nice. So awesome. So you will be coming to the United States in 2028. That's awesome. The United States is a big place though. So I don't live where a lot of other people live, but um, I just just um, had a conversation with a couple friends. Shout out to Doug and Mike. And uh, they had visited Sri Lanka. They said that place was crazy. Lots and lots of people, Sri Lanka. Where did they go? They went to Colombo. And I think they went to Candy. 
So yeah, we just had a, a conversation last week about Sri Lanka, how it would be nice to visit for a short period of time because lots of people, lots of noise, but very nice people, they said. They had fun. And the food was great. The food was great, they said. All right, where else are we going here? All right. Dunsne, good to see you in here from Cuba. A few more. I think we have a few more utensils to talk about, so let's do it. I think the next one we need to talk about is the one that was in the thumbnail, and that is ladle. Ladle. It, it's basically like a big spoon, right? So here's the definition of what a ladle is. A ladle is a large spoon for serving soup or stew. I hope you know what soup is in English. I hope that would make this a lot easier. So if you know what a soup is, but you don't know what a stew is, just think of a stew as a lot thicker soup. So a soup might have a little more liquid or water you might call it broth in it. And then a stew will have less liquid and more chunks of stuff, maybe more chunks of meat or maybe more chunks of vegetables. But a, a stew is a little thicker than a soup. But you might use a ladle to dish out the soup or the stew dish out that might be a phrasal verb you're not familiar with so dish out it's another way to say serve dish out speaking of serve let's talk about that verb in this sentence i used a ladle to serve the stew let me say that again i used a ladle to serve the soup I ladled the soup into a bowl. So in that first sentence, ladle is a noun, it's a thing. And in the second sentence, I used it as a verb. Because again, with most of these utensils, you can use them as verbs, what you do with that utensil. I used a ladle to serve the soup. I ladled the soup into a bowl. Hopefully that helps. The next one, tongs, tongs. In my family, we really only have one set of tongs and we do have a dishwasher. So sometimes when the tongs are used and we only have one set and it's in the dishwasher, I will take those tongs out of the dishwasher and hand wash them because we may need two sets of tongs at my house, but we only have one set, but I don't mind hand washing every so often. Tongs are utensils with two arms for gripping and serving food. There are just some foods that you could stab with a fork. How do you like that verb there? You could stab it with a fork, but sometimes it just takes too long. Tongs are great when you want to make salad. I picked up lettuce with tongs to add to my salad. You know lettuce? I mean, you could stab it with a fork all day long to try to serve it, but it might take too long. The tongs, perfect for picking up lettuce. The next one, peeler, peeler. And guess what you do with a peeler? You peel things. Now, before we get too far, I will be using peel and skin interchangeably. And we usually use this with vegetables. So the outside of an apple can be called the peel, it could be called the skin, 
but usually for an apple, you will hear peel. For a banana, the yellow part on the outside, that's called a peel. Could you call it a skin? It probably, it's probably a peel. How about that fuzzy stuff on a peach? If you think of the outside of a peach, you could call it a peel, but we would probably call it a skin. Okay, so peel and skin are often used interchangeably. Think of a potato. You could call it the peel or you could call it the skin. So I wouldn't worry too much about the difference between peel or skin. Native English speakers will probably use them all correctly, but most of the time you can use either. I wouldn't worry about studying the difference between peel and skin. But a peeler is a tool for removing the skin from fruits and vegetables. I could say the same thing with peel. A peeler is a tool for removing the peel from fruits and vegetables. How about this? I often use a peeler to take off potato skins. And I think in that picture, that is what is being done. So you have a potato probably on a cutting board. The potatoes have probably been washed. And now that person is using a peeler to remove the potato skins. How about this? She peeled the apples with a peeler. So in that sentence, I'm using peel as a noun and I'm using peel as a verb. She peeled the apples with a peeler. She removed the skin of the apple. How about this? Corkscrew. I'm trying to think if my, my house even has a corkscrew. If we do, it doesn't look like this. And Mostly corkscrews are used for opening wine bottles. Corkscrew. There's the picture. Let's bring that up a little bit more. So there is the picture of a corkscrew. The arrow is pointing to the corkscrew. And if you look at that thing at the bottom, that's a little lighter in color, that is called the cork. And if you've seen one of those, you've probably seen that cork to seal a bottle. So it's almost like a cap, but maybe it's a little better than a cap. I'm not sure why wine bottles have corks and soda bottles do not, but we call that item or that utensil a corkscrew. It helps removing corks. I have a couple sentences for you. A corkscrew is a tool for removing corks from bottles, often bottles of wine. And I know there are some people in the chat who do not drink alcohol. It's probably a good thing. But if you ever need to open a wine bottle, you will most likely need a corkscrew. He used a corkscrew to open the wine. <coughs> Excuse me. I think I may need to take a drink of water. And I think I should ask you to listen to this while I do. If this lesson is helping your English improve, don't forget to tap that like button and share it with a friend who's learning English. Right. Thank you. Very professional sounding voice. Yeah. If this uh, English lesson is helping you and you have a friend that's also learning English, share it with them. They might become even a better friend. They might say to you in a couple weeks, oh my goodness, American English with Brent. I'm so glad you showed this to me. Maybe you'll make more friends. I don't know. Let's check the chat. Make sure we are not missing anything here. 58 people watching. Welcome. Yeah, 
it's a it's a confusing thing greater maybe i will need to make an english lesson all about different ways in english to compare things maybe that's a good one to make oh yeah great one all right freddie wolf good use of this here yeah if you um have lighter skin maybe like mine and you go out into the sun you could get what we call sunburnt where your skin will not get darker but it will get redder and after a couple days some layers of your skin might start peeling or start coming off but absolutely if you get a sunburn maybe your skin would peel is that right yes it is right all right what do we usually call the liquid part in stew or soup here's an example i've had enough beef i just want to take the liquid thingy only i mean harry if you ever said liquid thingy i think native english speakers would know exactly what you're talking about and i think they would like it that sounds awesome and you know that liquid thingy say that that'll be awesome but if you want to sound I don't know. I was going to say, if you want to sound more like a native English speaker, but we do that stuff all the time. I don't know that little, that little thingy, you know, the thingy, we say that quite a bit, but you might say uh, broth. You might say broth or soup, the liquid stuff in soup, you probably call it broth. Yeah. I think that's, that's what I would use broth. Carlos, you are very welcome. All right. Tankung, interesting man you are. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Omron says a corkscrew isn't that popular in kitchen tinsels. I think you can open it in different ways. Yeah, I think so. Um, if the bottle has a cork, though, I think you will need a corkscrew if it has a cap maybe i should have mentioned this but we would just call it a bottle opener so if you have a bottle of soda and it's not a twist off sometimes soda caps are twist offs it's fine but if you need a bottle opener to get it open it's not a twist off hopefully a little extra english there for you Twist off. I have mentioned it, I know, in other English lessons, but a, a twist off cap. All right, a couple more here. I think we have, don't we? Oh my gosh. Okay. I just talked about bottle opener, but let's talk about can opener. Can opener. I mean, some of these things in English are just like, exactly what they do right we use a can opener to open a can sometimes english is very difficult and sometimes it's just so easy can opener what does that do it opens a can yeah so here it's it's actually quite simple a can opener is a tool for opening canned goods i don't know what those are Maybe a can of tuna fish, maybe a can of tomatoes, maybe a can of soup. But you see there are two different types of can openers there. One is an electric can opener, and one is a can opener you have to use by hand, we would say. The one on the right, or right, you would have to use that by hand which is the kind of can opener I have in my house. Is it a little harder to do? Yeah. But is it less likely to break? Yeah. So we just have a, a can opener that you use by hand, not an electric can opener. How about this? I need a can opener to open this can of tomatoes. Here's another good one. I think one of my favorites, 
That in the picture is what we call an oven mitt. An oven mitt is something you can put on your hands so you don't get burned. Yeah, maybe you are taking a hot plate out of the oven. You don't want to burn your hands. Put on an oven mitt that will protect them. What about this? I used an oven mitt to take the cookies out of the oven. Safety first. Safety first. This is the last one. And then we will be done with the English lesson. Measuring cup. So in the picture, you can see two types of measuring cups. The one on the left, the one on the left, the bigger one, we might use for measuring liquids. And the four smaller ones, we might use for measuring more solid things like sugar, salt, flour. The one, uh, the bigger one, you might measure water or oil or milk. But a measuring cup is a container for measuring ingredients. It's just what it sounds like. And uh, what can be a little confusing in American cookbooks is that you might see ounces, or you might see cups, or you might see quarter cups, half cups, a third of a cup, but you also might see milliliters. So on that bigger measuring cup, you might have all three. You might have milliliters, you might have cups, and you might have something called ounces, which we might only use in the United States, ounces and cups, not liters or milliliters. But how about this sentence? I need a measuring cup for the flour. And notice how flour is spelt. You will see that type of flour in a kitchen, but you won't see it out in a field. That is F-L-O-W-E-R. Little different. Let's check the chat. Any questions? Well, Tanya. Tanya, thank you so much. Do have a little something for you. Might be a little loud, but I would like to celebrate that super chat. Oh, thank you so much for the super chat. Took a little sip of water there. Yeah, my, my throat was getting a little, little dry this morning. A little more often than it usually does. What else do we have here? Oh, Michael, I like what you did there. Seems like Michael might have a cat and he might serve his cat canned cat food. So he opens the, the cans for his cat. Therefore, he is the can opener for his cat. Love it. It's a good one. Freddie, love what you did there. I hope you're, I, I really, Freddie, I really hope you are a dad because this is the, the perfect dad joke. This is the quintessential dad joke. Big word there. Quintessential. It means like the perfect type. Can you open a can with a can opener? Yes, I can. Freddie, that's almost so bad that it's good. I like it. Hmm. Hmm. Harry, are you also a father? Because this is another really good dad joke right here. This flower is made of flour. Hmm. So it would be an edible flower. So if you can eat something, you can use that adjective edible. That's it. All right, Leo likes it. Leo likes it. Nicely done. Etienne Beaumont, welcome. That is a new name I do not recognize. If you are new here, please don't forget. Subscribe so you never miss an English lesson. But yeah, definitely. It's very difficult. Now, the good thing about flour and flour 
if you are just speaking English, you don't have to worry about the difference. If you are reading or writing, well, of course you do. Omron, the professional chef would only use measuring cups? Ooh. I don't know. You know, Omron, I think it's the professional chefs who don't use measuring cups because they're just so good, they can eyeball it. So I just used eyeball as a verb. But if you don't need a measuring cup and you can just eyeball something to know like what amount you should use, that's pretty good. I always use a measuring cup because I'm not very good at it. Filippo, well said. So knife is not a utensil I talked about here because I think most people who watch this channel would know knife and spoon and fork. But yeah, a knife. You can't use that as a verb. Good one, Filippo. Yeah, a knife cuts or chops, but it doesn't, it doesn't knife. Hmm. Not a dad yet. Okay, well, you are preparing because I think you have some good dad jokes. That's it. That's the lesson for this week. So like I said, let me get rid of this. Make sure you uh, subscribe and all that stuff because there will be a new English lesson this week. Probably two. One about flying things. I did a live English lesson. No, no, not flying things. Um, I just, I just edited it, edited it yesterday. What is it? I can't remember. There is a live English lesson that I did about a year ago and it was about an hour long. And what I did is I made it shorter to about 15 minutes, only the lesson. And um, there should be another one out from Lexington. So lots of stuff from the channel this week. And I think a new live lesson next week. Eyeball. We can use it as a phrase, as a, as a, as a verb. Yeah. Let's see, um, think about the English lesson I did with my brother in his backyard and he was chopping wood. Sometimes he just eyeballed it. Like he knew about the size to cut it. So he didn't measure it. Sometimes, sometimes he did measure it, but if in, instead of measuring something perfectly, you can just eyeball it. Yeah. Hopefully that is a good good extra little bonus English lesson there. English term there. All right. Well, I'm sorry that you're a little late. We're we're wrapping this English lesson up. It means it's it's coming to an end. Just taking any last minute questions. Omron, thank you. Thank you for watching. Tanya, thank you. No, Tanya, Ben has not joined one of my live lessons. At Thanksgiving, we were working on that, but it seems like his phone is a little bit old. He doesn't like technology that much. So he may have to sit in, in this room with me. I don't think he will be able to join by phone like you did earlier, Tanya, or Sita did earlier. All right, thank you, Nazuki. Fun and useful. I appreciate that. Yeah, watch on replay. It's good because I cover a lot of material. I cover a lot of new words in an hour. So watching it twice, three times might not be a bad thing. Well, I would like to thank you all for joining me for another week. Another live lesson here on utensils. If there is an English lesson you want to see, leave it in the chat. I'll take a look. I'll try to make it happen. All right. Adios, amigos. Thank you for joining. See ya. Wait, I need to, I need to end with adios, amigos. An English